it's my great pleasure to have with us Dr. B. M. Makkar, who will be the our next orator for Diacare Gold Medal Oration. And to chair this session, I request our senior colleague from Ahmedabad, Dr. Mahadev Desai. Prof. Ma Dr. Mahadev Desai is a teacher for me. It's my great Chitendra pleasure. Sahar, a very close friend of mine from Dr. Disa and Dr. Sanjay Mandiratta from Jaipur for this prestigious oration to chair. Over to Dr. Mahadev Desai to introduce Dr. B. M. Makkar. But before that, I will request Dr. A. K. Das and Dr. Shashank Joshi, the program director and chief advisor of the program, to and I will invite Dr. B. M. Makkar to felicitate Dr. B. M. Makkar. I will request Dr. A. K. Das and Dr. Shashank Joshi to join along with Dr. Mahadev Bhai and Jitendra Nagar and Dr. Mandiratta. <coughs> I will request Dr. Uh, Madhav Desai and Dr. Sanjay Mandiratta to read citation for Dr. B. M. Makkar, sir. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to uh, welcome and it's our proud privilege to honor this Dayakir. It's privileged to award Dayakir gold medal oration for the year 2022 to Dr. B. M. Makkar. He is an MD, FIMS, FICP, FRSSDI, FRCP Glasgow, Edinburgh, FSCP USA, and FSCE USA. Dr. Bridge Makkar is director of Dr. Makkar's Diabetes and Obesity Center, New Delhi. He is president elect in RSSDI 2022, honorary secretary RSSDI 2017 till 19, ex chairman RSSDI Delhi, chapter member in executive board Diabetes India. He is member in AACI International Committee 2014-2016-17 and AACE Professional Business Committee AACE DSN 2017 to 2020. He is course director of Advanced Certificate Course in Diabetes ACCD 2010 till date. His publication in books, national and international journals. He, it is our most profound honor to present you with Dr. O. P. Gupta Oresan for the year 2022. Uh, signed by the organization chairman, Dr. Bansi Saab. Thank you for that kind uh, introduction. Good morning, everyone. It's indeed a pleasure to be in the city of Ahmedabad, where I've been multiple times, and it is uh, because of our dear friend, Dr. Bansi Sabu. And I'm truly humbled by this oration that I have been awarded at Dayak Air Con. And also, it's indeed an honor to receive this from stalwarts like Professor Ashok Das and dear friend Shashank. So, today I am going to speak on. So, uh, Banshi wanted me to, you know, talk on something different. And uh, then I thought, let us uh, have a different topic. So I'm going to speak on management of diabetes, guidelines versus rationale. And I don't have any disclosure for this presentation. So we all know that the poorly controlled diabetes is associated with a significant risk of long-term complications, both microvascular and macrovascular complications and uh, diabetes doubles the risk of acute coronary artery disease. Also, once the person gets events, the risk is doubled even further. Almost half the people with diabetes have uncontrolled hypertension and diabetes is also leading cause of death worldwide. But when we are talking about all these things, when we are talking about diabetes, what we don't, you know, understand is that we are talking about only poorly controlled diabetes. 
What about if it is controlled well? Well controlled diabetes is associated with a long and healthy life, a normal life. So more important issue is how well we are controlling diabetes. We are always looking at the complications because we are presuming that person is going to be poorly controlled. And all the guidelines actually give us, you know, therapeutic strategies which are focusing on that. So this is the latest guideline we know and first line therapy we always, uh, you know, have been seeing I think more than a decade now that there is a sequential therapy which is advised. You start with lifestyle intervention and metformin. And after that, the first thing is you look for presence of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or risk factors or kids, chronic kidney disease or heart failure. So we are looking for patients who have already got damaged, who have already got heart disease or heart failure or CKD and we are focusing on that segment of the guide, you know, population who is already having complications. We are not looking at the seg, and if you look at the, it is not just diabetes guidelines, even the cardiology guidelines are focusing on that. But we are not looking at the larger part of the guide population, which is having no cardiovascular disease or not many risk factors. And what we are doing about this. So, let's see what we have in terms of evidence for management of diabetes. In last almost 10 to 15 years, you, we have had a number of trials, MPAREG, TCOS, all DPP-4 trials, all SGLT-2 trials, all GLP-1 trials. Which is the population targeted here? The population targeted is the population who either had established car atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD, or at very high risk for that. What about the new detected type 2 diabetes people or diabetes people who do not have the established complications? We know we, from the understanding of pathophysiology and pathobiology that it, glucose is an important contributor or important causative agent for causing both long-term microvascular as well as macrovascular complications of diabetes. So controlling glucose that way is paramount to management of diabetes. And this is a meta-analysis of 27,000 plus participants where 2370 events were recorded in terms of cardiovascular events and they looked at how the good glycemic control or until early intervention matters. And if you see the people who had duration of diabetes which is less or they don't have macrovascular disease or microvascular disease are the ones actually benefit with glucose intensive control versus the conventional control. So we don't have to wait for these diseases, these complications to happen before become, becoming aggressive in management of diabetes. And studies have also shown that if you are leaving these people uncontrolled for one year, A1C level of more than 7% lasting for one year gives you an increased risk of myocardial infarction by 67%, increased risk of stroke by 51%, increased risk of heart failure and composite of MIHF and stroke by almost 62%. Now let us see what we understood or what we have learned from the long-term early intervention or intensive control trials. The first one was DCCTT, DCCT and it clearly showed in type 1 people that intensive glucose control was associated with significant reduction in all microvascular complications and as the A1C goes up, the risk of complications also goes up. Now look at the follow-up of DCCT. It is not just the microvascular complications. During the follow-up, we also saw there is a significant benefit in terms of reducing the cardiovascular events. And the cumulative incidence of any first event was lower by almost 42% if you manage these patients early with intensive glucose control. Similarly, we looked at, we have data from UKPDS, 1% reduction in A1C gives you significant reduction in microvascular complications. 
and to begin with non significant reduction in macrovascular complications also but 10 years follow up from ukpds this reduction in macrovascular complications also became significant again highlighting the fact that early intensive control is the most important thing that we should focus and this is the 30 year follow up data from dcct and clearly showed that there was 30% reduction in the first of any of the predefined cv outcomes in people who were treated in the intensive arm and the there was re almost 32% reduction in the occurrence of first uh, mace now when you buy a new car, the important thing is, do you get it serviced regularly and maintain it nicely or you don't service it? Because it is new car, do you neglect it because it is going to run fine for next five, seven years and once it gets dirty or it starts giving problems, then you start servicing it. So if you start servicing it right from day one, 20 years down the line, you still have a pretty good, well-maintained new car, though it will look old, it will be a vintage car. But if you don't service it, this is what you get. This is the people who develop atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or CKD or heart failure or whatever. So a 60 years old patient with established CVD and only seven years history of type 2 diabetes, there are two different kind of patients. So if you are controlling glucose in these patients who have already have established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it is like hoping that once nuclear warhead is detonated, the peace talks are going to prevent the further explosions. So look at the different aspect of uh, diabetes. We have an integrated area of hyperglycemia, which leads to, which is further going on to progress to development of risk factors and clinically evident CVD. Now, where we are looking at in terms of intervention in the trials in the CVOTs is this area. Actually, we should be looking here and this is the area where it should be intervening. Now, we move on to the understanding of how the hyperglycemia is caused and uh, DeFronzo gave Banting Oration 2008 and first time changed and our understanding actually that hyperglycemia is contributed to not only by insulin deficiency and insulin resistance alone, there are multiple mechanisms which are contributing to hyperglycemia. And since there are multiple mechanisms contributing to hyperglycemia, we need more than one drugs to under address this underlying pathophysiological disturbances. So we need to have metformin or insulin sensitizer on board. We need to have a GLP-1 receptor agonist or DPP-4 inhibitor on board to address this. We need to, if we are using sulfonylurea, it is going to address only the insulin secretion. We need to have SGLT-2 inhibitors to address the renal mechanism. So we need multiple drugs. But the problem is, once the person is diagnosed with diabetes, the first drug is initiated in more than half of the people only after one year. For first year, we are not even initiating therapy. This is the global scenario. But India, we are doing wonderful because the first drug gets initiated in most of the people, almost 86% of the people get first drug initiated immediately. That's metformin. But what about the further intensification of therapy? Second drugs get gets added again, you know, after a delay and more than 50% are getting only after one year of uncontrolled period and there India is also not doing better. This is the, uh, you know, study from Professor Kamlesh Kunti from UK which showed that if somebody is already on one oral agent and A1C is in the range of 7%, the intensification happens after almost three years. If it is at 7.5%, intensification takes about two years to get. And it is at 8%, the intensification on an average happens at 1.6 years. This is with one drug. Now what if you are already on two or three drugs? The average time to intensification in uncontrolled people is about six to seven years. So we are leaving these people, these, these are all unserviced cars which are going to end up as badly damaged cars. We are leaving these people to wait for the 
heart to get damaged or kidney to get damaged and then start looking at the CV outcome data, how to manage these people. So, in clinical practice, this is the same, you know, study, the average time to intensification after two drugs goes up to six years, which is actually really bad. And what guidelines recommend is sequential therapy that you start with metformin lifestyle intervention. If the A1C goes above seven, then you intensify it. So what happens is between two in intensifications, two, you know, add-ons, there is always a period of hyperglycemia. So we are exposing these people to hyperglycemic burden perpetually time and again and exposing them to the increased risk of damage to all kinds of complications. While we should be, you know, focusing on keeping the A1C below the target level all the time through the course of disease to make sure that these people don't end up with complications. Now, when DeFranzo gave this banting oration, I was also there and ADA immediately, uh, you know, announced a grant to compare the DeFranzo's approach to management of diabetes versus the sequential therapy of diabetes management. And this is called ADDICT study, the efficacy and durability of initial combination therapy for type 2 diabetes. And this was a randomized trial, open label, where the uh, pathophysiological based approach, the patients were given uh, exanatide, glitazone and metformin right from day one of the diagnosis of diabetes. And the second arm is the sequential therapy based on the A1C levels as recommended by the guidelines. And 24 months down the line, there was a significantly lower A1C level in people who were on the uh, intervention arm or the triple drug therapy as compared to the sequential therapy. Not only that, there was again a better survival probability in people who were already on triple drug therapy right from day one as compared to those who were on con sequential therapy. And now we have six years follow-up data which was actually presented at ADA meeting 2008, 18, yeah, 18. And again showed that there is significantly better durable glycemic control if you are intervening early with three drugs as compared to sequential therapy. The A1C was lower by almost 0.7% this arm. Now we recently also had data from Verify trial which looked at starting metformin versus metformin vildagliptin in new detected type 2 diabetes individuals the as recent as it could be, drug naive or at best treated with metformin for less than four weeks. So average duration of diabetes in these individuals was only few months and average starting A1C was 6.7%. So if you look at the 6.7% A1C, one will wonder according to guidelines why we are treating with them with two drugs. And they were treated and followed up and the metformin arm, if the A1C went up above 7.7% on two different occasions in six months, then the vildagliptin was added. And if the, there was failure of control again, then they were again added to insulin therapy. What did we get? 26% better chances of sustaining a durable control over five years period as compared to the monotherapy arm. Now, does that mean that we are having better control or does it also mean that we are having a better, we are possibly modifying the disease? There was a clear indication that there was improvement in beta cell function in people who were treated with Vilda metformin arm as compared to metformin alone. And not only that, looking, when we are looking at the side effects, there was significantly lower number of uh, cardiovascular events in people treated with dual therapy as compared to monotherapy. Though this is not a CV outcome trial, but all the cardiovascular events were adjudicated and there was almost 30% 30, 30 reduction in the risk of uh, having a cardiovascular event in people who were initiated on dual therapy. And this is, mind you, 
all new detected type 2 diabetes individuals who had starting A1C of 6.7%. They didn't have any established risk factors or atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, this is a meta-analysis of, uh, you know, uh, type 2 diabetes individuals who have been treated on vildagliptin metformin versus comparators. And this study, again done, this study was done by Mark Evans in 2015. And this involved patients from all vildagliptin trials. And they compared, they tried to find out why these people are not getting CV outcomes, CV benefits. So they classified the patients into two groups, less than 65 years of age, so people with type 2 diabetes, younger age, lesser duration, and those who are already more than 65 years of age. In people who are more than 65 years, it was neutral, CV neutral, no CV benefit. But people who were less than 65 years of age, there was 37% relative risk reduction in uh, first mace. So, based on the VERIFY study, the ADA ESD 2021 recommendation stated that whereas we previously stated there was limited evidence for initial combination therapy, the Vildagliptin efficacy in combination with metformin in verified trial provides additional information and we now suggest that providers should engage in shared decision making for initial combination therapy in new detected cases of type 2 diabetes. This is ADA ESD guideline 2021. And we have RSSDA guideline. We also recommend considering initial combination therapy, but only when we have A1C of more than 1.5, or in some cases where it is considered that single agent may not be able to achieve a target of A1C, we should initiate with dual therapy. So, to conclude my presentation, the rational or evidence-based approach to management of type 2 diabetes suggests that we should have early aggressive intervention to control glycemia. We should initiate with combination therapy so that we can prevent complications rather than focus on what after the complications have happened. We should look at normal healthy life for persons with diabetes rather than preventing events or reducing the risk of events after they have already got complications. Guidelines recommend sequential therapy even now, and they have been doing for more than a decade. And so there is an inertia within the guidelines. The guidelines are not willing to change, change the concept moving away from the sequential therapy. It is time to move from the guideline inertia to early aggressive intervention and achieving good glycemic control for people with diabetes and to prevent events before they happen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.